Uh, welcome everyone and thanks for um, coming to this Society of Labour Lawyers uh, housing subgroup meeting. My name is Nick Bano and I've been um, helping to coordinate the subgroup for the last couple of years together with the conveners uh, Liz Davis and Stephen Hockman QC and uh, we're particularly pleased to host this um, event tonight and to welcome um, so many new members um, because we've been fairly active in the last couple of years. We've put on a number of um, events um, including a couple of events in Parliament um, and an excellent meeting um, with Emident Code about requisitioning empty homes. And we've been offering um, technical expertise to the shadow housing team, uh, commenting on labour policy, responding to consultations, etc. Um, but events overtook us a bit towards the end of last year with party conference, general election, um, leadership elections and so on. But we were really delighted to find out that in the meantime, um, lots of Society of Labour Lawyers members had been uh, gradually expressing an interest in joining the, the housing subgroup. So we're really pleased to welcome you here today and look forward to um, building on this event as a bigger um, and better subgroup going forward. We've got three excellent speakers tonight on this important and timely uh, topic, how to protect renters, particularly private renters, during and after uh, the pandemic. First, we have Rosalie Dorfman Mahaja, who's a barrister at four to five Grays in Square Chambers. She specialises in housing law matters, um, acting in possession claims and other housing law cases, and really sees the um, the day to day realities of, of housing law. Wendy Pettifer is very, very experienced as a legal aid solicitor. She's currently a consultant with the Anti Trafficking and Labour Exploitation Unit, but before that, she worked in law centres. Uh, and is very active in supporting vulnerable people in various different capacities. And finally, we have Claire Walden, who's an organiser with uh, London Renters Union. And London Renters Union has really um, come into its own in recent weeks. It's at the forefront um, of standing up for private tenants, and it's just started a new campaign called Can't Pay, Won't Pay, which aims to collectively protect and support tenants who are struggling uh, financially. After we've heard from the three speakers, there'll be time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please either put your hand up with the um, put your hand up function or send me a question directly um, and I'll read your question out if you prefer not to be um, filmed. And finally, if you'd like to get more involved um, in the subgroup, please do let me know because we'd be delighted to work with you. We're very keen um, to work together with this new broader uh, membership to work out uh, collectively what uh, we should be doing as a housing subgroup and how we can go forward. Uh, my email address was on the invitation, um, so please um, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, and so first of all, I'll pass over to Rosalie. Thank you, Nick, for that introduction. Um, I will now discuss first the, an introduction to this topic, and then I will go into detail about um, the current housing law in relation to coronavirus. Housing was in crisis before COVID-19, but the crisis is pushing more people into hardship. This is particularly acute in the private rented sector, which has increased dramatically in recent years. From 2007 to 2017, there was an increase in the number of households living in private rented accommodation by 63%. Private renters are generally younger, in 2017, the largest group of private sector tenants were in the age bracket of 25 to 34 year olds, according to the ONS. So what's happened since coronavirus? In brief, there's been a three month stay of possession proceedings and the Coronavirus Act 2020 extends the notice period which landlords have to give tenants before they can start possession proceedings. All notice periods are now three months. So for no fault, for the no fault ground, section 21, it's been extended by one month. As John Healy MP said, it just gives people longer to pack their bags. Rent arrears will continue to accrue during this period. The government has not revealed any plans yet to prevent evictions caused by rent arrears resulting from the impact of COVID. Some people's wages have currently been protected by the furlough scheme, but on the horizon, we see people's wages decreasing people having to give up work to be full-time carers or redundancies as the economy shrinks. We are already seeing this economic impact. According to research carried out for The Guardian, six in 10 renters have said that they 
suffered financially as a result of the lockdown. If nothing is done to support these renters, they could swiftly be made homeless. So the first section of, in the first section of this talk, I will discuss the stay that was imposed. So this was imposed on the uh, 27th of March, 2020. It's a new practice direction which came into effect on that date, which stayed possession proceedings and warrants of eviction brought under part 55. The stay was for 90 days and it will expire on the 25th of June. At present, we don't have any further guidance about what will happen after that date. And there is a real fear that this, after that date, there will be a flood of uh, possession cases in the courts. Why was this stay brought in? The judiciary, in the judiciary's announcement, it said that it complements the Coronavirus Act 2020 to prevent imminent evictions and delay possession proceedings. The first paragraph of Practice Direction 51 Z also states that the provision was made to ensure that the administration of justice is carried out so as not to endanger public health. This practice direction was obviously welcomed. However, it did create some confusion in the legal community as to whether it was a blanket stay which judges had no power to dispense with and whether there were any obligations to comply with directions during this period. So on the 20th of April, amendments to this practice direction were made. And it says that the stay does not apply to first, a claim against trespassers, second, a claim for an interim possession order, and these are commonly used to evict squatters, and it does not apply to an application for case management directions agreed by all the parties. It also states that the stay does not preclude the issuing of a claim form, and this may be particularly worrying for renters who have received a notice of seeking possession before the Coronavirus Act 2020 was enacted. So a legal challenge was brought against the stay in the case of Arkin, a fixed charge receiver, and Marshall. On the 24th of April 2020, the judge, a judge in the County Court of Central London determined that he had no power whatsoever to lift the stay in individual cases. This was then very quickly appealed and heard in the Crown in the Court of Appeal at the end of this, at the end of April. The judge dismissed the challenge that the practice direction was ultra vires and found it was indeed lawful. It stated that whilst in theory a judge did have discretion under its general case management powers to lift the stay, it would almost always be wrong in principle to use it. The court actually only envisaged one possible case where that might be so exceptional to warrant lifting the stay. That is, if the stay would defeat the purpose of the practice direction and endanger public health. So the second part of my talk um, is about injunctions. Stay expressly does not apply to injunctions. A renter may need to bring an injunction against their landlord if their landlord has unlawfully evicted them, such as if the landlord has taken the possession of the property without a court order. There has been a concern, however, that an injunction may be used to actually exclude people from their properties and effectively get possession through the back door. I believe this would be rare, and especially now where um, the stay is due to be lifted quite soon. And the third part, the third part I'd like to discuss with you is the consequences of, of court closures across the country. Many courts have been closed during the pandemic. HMCTS are producing weekly updates about which courts are temporarily closed, open to the public or staffed. There may be imminent change to this as yesterday some jury trials started and HMTCS have recently published their risk assessment for staff and court users. The judiciary have produced guidance about what is priority work. However, it is up to individual courts which cases are listed and when. Those hearings, where possible, are now often done by video conferencing or telephone. The list of priority work that is relevant to renters are first, applications to suspend warrants of eviction, and that's going to be very important once the stay, the general stay is lifted. Second, injunctions, which we've touched on previously. 
Third, homelessness applications, which I know uh, very well are, are continuing through video conferencing. And third, uh, sorry, fourth, is civil proceedings in the magistrate's court, in particular applications relating to public health legislation. For example, tenants can bring statutory nuisance cases themselves against landlords if their property is in such a state as to be prejudicial to health or a nuisance. The final um, aspect that I'd like to cover is the implication of accrual of rent arrears. So the tenant's liability does not stop during this period. As assured, uh, assured shorthold tendencies, uh, most of which most rented tenancies are, um, a section eight notice can be served if a tenant has two months of arrears, if the, month, if the rent is paid monthly. At present, we do not know whether there will be any amnesty on any rent arrears which accrued as a result of the pandemic. What we have now is government guidance in Eng uh, for England, which was produced by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Uh, this says that notices can still be served, but the government has asked landlords to not issue any notices of seeking possession as a result of rent arrears, particularly given that the tenant may be sick or facing other hardship due to COVID-19. If a tenant is unable to pay the rent in full, the guidance says that they should tell their landlord and the, landlords, the landlord and tenants should work very, very close together and should offer, and I quote, support and understanding to tenants who may, seek, who may see their income fluctuate. The government advises that landlords who are facing the situation should discuss taking up the three month mortgage payment holiday with their mortgage lenders, which has been widely announced in the media. The guidance also says that the government has made 500 million pounds available to local authorities to fund households experiencing hardship. However, it is not entirely clear how public sector tenants can access that funding. Importantly, the guidance fails to mention what the tenants should do if the landlord doesn't agree to any rent reduction or doesn't show any sympathy towards their situation. These guidelines are not legally binding. If a pre-action protocol does not supersede the government's guidance, when the courts return, the judges will have to interpret the guidelines in individual cases. So what might that look like? If a renter does make efforts to ask uh, for a rent reduction to their landlord in line with this guidance, the courts may take that into account in, whether, in deciding whether or not it is reasonable to grant possession. However, if a landlord brings a possession case on the basis of section 21, such as the no faults ground or grant eight, which is the mandatory ground for rent arrears, the court does not apply a reasonableness test and therefore it's difficult to see how the government's guidance uh, would apply. The court must grant possession if the landlord has complied with all of the procedural requirements. In ground eight cases, an adjournment might be permitted if there are exceptional circumstances in, um, in the case of North British Homes and Matthews. However, it remains to be seen if the courts will consider COVID-19 to fall under that category. So in summary, what should you do if um, you can't afford your rent at present? Well, the government is telling you that you should um, write to your landlord and ask for a rent reduction or ask them to be sympathetic during this time. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Wendy. Hello. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks very much, Rosalie, for that excellent introduction to which I haven't got a great deal to add. Just to stress that Section 21 notices apply to fixed term, assured short hold tenancies and private renters. Um, and really, the only concession is to extend that notice by a month. Um, a, a kind of small point is that there are still a few a few thousand, I think, protected tenants who um, 
have occupied their tenancies continuously since the before February 1988 and landlords only used to have to give four weeks notice to them that's been extended to three months um, there's no protection for people who are in interim accommodation mainly for homeless families it's generally determined that they occupy as licensees rather than tenants although there can be exceptions to that rule uh, so the three month notice period doesn't apply to them in the same way it doesn't apply to tenants who uh, are lodgers with living landlords um, a lot of hope has been kind of put onto the um, production of a pre-action protocol for private tenants there's already one in place for social tenants of social housing landlords where in order to um, proceed with the possession claim the landlord has to show that they've made, made reasonable attempts to find out the tenant circumstances therefore any COVID-19 illness lack of employment death um, could be taken into account there um, I mean my advice I've been uh, supporting um, the renters union a bit with advice and um, I agree there's going to be an absolute tsunami of possession claims once the stay is lifted it's really really difficult for people people can't even they're not even eligible for legal aid until a possession claim has been started they can't get legal aid just on service of a notice legal aid is, was already in a dreadful state with ccms and has got even worse with sickness etc due to covid so what i would say to people if they do get notice of proceedings is always put in there's a standard defense form always 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 put in um any circumstances that have given rise to the arrears like rosalie said letters um showing of efforts to um make reasonable offers to pay some of the rent um and um medical evidence if they've been sick uh, etc because um at present or in the past before covid lots and lots of uh, possession orders were granted on uh, expiry of section 21 notices without a hearing so if you put in a detailed defense form at least you get a hearing at least you get to go before a district judge for five minutes or five seconds or whatever and try and explain your case um this in terms of legal evictions again um although the stay doesn't apply to illegal evictions i'm sure claire will back me up on this that there's been a really massive increase in illegal evictions and again because of 10 years of austerity it's really really hard for people to access legal advice and legal aid about the evictions uh, and the procedure is quite complicated particularly when the courts are closed i would say from a cynical perspective that the stay was brought in because the courts were closed and that was the main reason that there weren't going to be any possession proceedings issued anyway um, so another point is that lots of people in precarious lifestyles people with no recourse to public funds irregular migrants etc are all incredibly vulnerable they're too scared to go anywhere near the courts they're in informal arrangements with members of their own community etc and they are also being evicted I um, hope that we'll get on to discussing what we can do about all this towards the end so I won't put forward the ideas that we've banded about and ideas that indeed have been put forward to the new uh, shadow cabinet minister for housing Sangam Debonair but um, I think any points to take away at the moment if you are in the business of advising clients is that at the moment the stay and the extension of section 21 is only till the 25th of june um, the guidance as rosalie said isn't legally binding it's open to interpretation for the courts to um, consider how they will take that into account particularly where the landlord relies on arrears um, as well as the service of the section 21 notice oh and there was just one other thing that i did want to mention which is universal credit we all know the terrible hardship that the five week waiting period it has caused for people in universal credit and even before COVID-19 um, we were seeing rises in possession proceedings and homelessness because people had no income with which to pay their rent for a minimum of five weeks um, the only money they can 
quite rarely get from the DWP is a loan, which is then deducted from their benefit compulsorily at I think about the rate of about 18 quid a week um, off very low benefits um, if and when they ever do actually get any money. So um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions, but that's all I'm going to say for the moment. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, so my name's Claire and I am a member of the London Renters Union. I'm a member of the Newham and Leytonstone branch. So a bit like trade unions, we have branches as well. Um, and in the last couple of months, what a time to start. I've also started working for the union on our member solidarity work. So uh, member solidarity, I guess, in, in other organisations might be called casework or something like that. But we try and do to do the work on housing issues on a kind of member to member peer basis where we're kind of training each other up to to learn how to kind of win disputes with landlords and with councils. Um, so the London Renters Union, if you don't know, it's um, it's been in existence for about two and a half years now and it was formed by a coalition of groups um, who were kind of housing campaign groups in London who kind of felt that what we needed is a kind of institution, a bit like a trade union, where renters, we can actually build our power and build sufficient power that we can actually start changing stuff because renters, we're so incredibly disempowered at the moment. Um, we now have three branches. So we have a branch in Hackney, in Lewisham and in Newham. Um, and we have groups, groups are kind of mini branches that are forming in Tower Hamlets in Camden and somewhere else I always forget, I'm sorry to that location. Um, and at the moment we we're an organization with about 3000 members, um, but we are growing exponentially at the moment, I would say, um, with, the, with the crisis that we're all facing. Um, as an organization, I guess we have three main aims. So the first aim is that we want to support our members to kind of fight and win their own housing situation. So a lot of what we spend our time on in normal times is um, supporting members to get their, force their landlord to make repairs that they've been avoiding for months, if not years of doing, um, getting members uh, to, to get their landlord to pay them their deposit back. Um, we support members to, um, to not be moved by the council out of um, out of borough. So although we are primarily for private renters, and um, particularly our new and branch, lots of our members are in temporary accommodation. So they're still dealing with private landlords, but they're also being pushed around by the council as well. Um, and in normal time, that's what we spend a lot of our time on. Um, but we're also a campaigning organisation, so we, we think that we have to campaign for massive systemic change to the housing system. The balance of power is all wrong at the moment. Landlords basically can do whatever they want. We line their pockets and when we're in any way an inconvenience to them, they get rid of us. Um, and really another thing that we're aiming to do is build a really strong and representative community. So whenever we have a branch, whenever we have a group, we try and build a branch or group that represents the, the, the diversity of that area of that borough. Um, over the last two months, as I'm sure you can well believe, um, our work has mainly become about the fact that hundreds, if not over a thousand of our members can't pay their rent right now or are coming up to the point where they're really worrying about being able to pay rent. Um, I think it's something like at least 700 of our members that we know of are in arrears at the moment. Um, and yeah, we're kind of realising that there's a, a big issue around, um, around this. So as has been said earlier, there is this government guidance and landlords should be showing compassion and understanding towards their tenants. We've seen very, very little of that uh, bear out in any kind of way. So I was thinking about a, a member that I called last week. He was issued a section eight notice on like day 32 of not paying rent. So like the first possible day that he could have been issued a section eight, he was. Um, and like his wife and him have both lost their jobs in this time and they, they, the landlord and tenant, uh, sorry, agent doesn't care. Um, we're constantly being told by members the first thing that we tell our members to do is to go and negotiate with their landlord. That's the first thing that we tell them to do if they get in touch and say they can't pay their rent. Um, the success rate of that is incredibly low. Uh, the, the general response from landlords is that they're not going to take a mortgage holiday because they don't want to have to pay an extra bit of interest. 
um, that renters need to get rid of all of their savings, that they want to see the printouts of their bank statements. Um, is there not friends and family they can borrow money for from like any possible any possible thing except offering a rent reduction is kind of the main thing that we're getting back from landlords. Some landlords are saying a temporary rent reduction, but it's just going to acquire arrears. And, you know, a lot of our members are in more precarious types of work. It's really unclear to us when that money will ever be able to be paid back. Um, obviously, we're really concerned about when that when that when those arrears become more than two months arrears for the, the reasons that have been laid out already um but this has this has basically got us to the point where we we have now launched a campaign which is a can't pay won't pay campaign at the moment all that we're asking people to do is to go to our website and and make a pledge essentially about what sort of action they might be up for or what they're already doing so if they're not already paying rent which is a lot of our members um, we just want to add some collectivity around it some people have kind of been worrying that we're calling a rent strike at this point which we're not we're not doing at this point we need to build safety in numbers and we know that kind of the numbers that we have at the moment it would be we would be endangering our members actually to call a rent strike at this point and we, we know that but what we do want to do is build a, a, a sense of collectivity around this crisis because in normal times even we feel like if we have an issue it's our fault and it's an individual problem and not a systemic problem but even more so right now when we're all stuck in our homes um, we need to build a sense of collectivity and a sense of this is a systemic a crisis that requires a systemic solution and individual renters should not have to shoulder the burden right now as they are expected to the rest of the time and it's this is enough um, what we are seeing yeah as Wendy said we are seeing an increase in illegal evictions or attempted illegal evictions we have had some success in preventing those through like the union directly directly dealing with that landlord and like threatening them with taking legal action against them essentially um, and we've seen a massive rise in the number of renters who are being harassed by their landlord whether that be like verbal harassment or physical harassment we've seen countless landlords who have continued to kind of walk in and out of their their tenants homes during the crisis um, to do non-essential repairs to show people around any spare rooms and um, what's really clear to me is that you know the, the situation that we're in right now can't it can't go on and we do have to see we do have to see changes from the government and um, we have to see government protecting renters we do have some demands for our campaign which i'm just trying to find um and the demands for our campaign are sort of demands that we already agreed in our in our kind of democratic all members assembly last year but they kind of have been updated a bit for the times that we find ourselves in so we think that rent should be suspended and actually you've got joe biden in the us who is not exactly a like raving lefty who is you know putting through a suspension of rent bill or trying to do that in the us at the moment we think that rent arrears, rent debt needs to be cancelled and the government needs to shoulder the burden of this, not individual renters who are already uh, kind of as economically stretched as they possibly can be. Um, we need to see an extension to this eviction ban. We're incredibly fearful, as, it, as has been mentioned already, about what the next few months and years are going to bring in terms of a horrific eviction crisis. Um, we think there needs to be rent controls. I mean, that's obviously we've needed that for ages. Some of our members pay 60 or 70% of their income to their landlords. It's not okay. Um, but the other thing that we're really concerned about is that how the hostile environment has entered like renters who don't have recourse to public funds or renters who are undocumented um, are just treated so appallingly by landlords they are subject to like extreme amounts of violence because their landlord knows pretty much that they can get away with it because these people have few other options um and this is something that we want to see. we want to see the abolition of right to rent basically um i reckon i've said enough for now 
Thanks. Well, um, thank you all very much for that um, frightening um, description of where things stand. Um, we've got time for questions, and if it's all right, I'll take them in threes. I've got two to read out, um, and then we'll go to Dermot. Um, the first question is, um, do Labour's current proposals do enough to protect renters? And I think Wendy might have tantalisingly hinted that there might be some opinions about that. Um, the second question is, um, Wendy suggests that renters go before a judge to explain their case in the possession process. If renters decide to do so, is there any risk or likelihood of a renter being burdened with an order for the landlord's costs? Um, and then if we can go to Dermot for his question, please. Dermot, do you have a question? Yes, uh, I do. Um, I, I've been to a number of these uh, uh, Zoom meetings about uh, the uh, uh, housing situation, and uh, I, I'd be anxious to see the discussion uh, uh, move on as to what practical things uh, that we could do. Um, uh, uh, and I, I would like to uh, see these the society uh, consider uh, uh, writing up on the Labour Party website all the defences available to Section 21 notices and other defences in general and to have a discussion about practical issues, uh, the, the things that we, we could do uh, uh, in terms of uh, lobbying uh, uh, MPs and, and the like. Perhaps we can take answers in the same order in which the speaker spoke, so starting with Rosalie. Yes, yeah, so first the, the point from about um, costs. So yes, there is a danger that if renters um, do have to go to before a judge and explain um, why they got into rent arrears that they might be burdened with landlord's costs as in, as in any other case. Um, but in practice, I've seen very rarely that landlords actually do go after tenants for their costs because usually they don't have any money, so there's not much point going after them, um, if, unless they do come into money at some point. Um, in relation to do Labour's policies do enough to, uh, prevent, uh, to prevent evictions right now, um, I think you know, they, are, they are optimistic. Um, about the outlook, the economic outlook we are coming into. Um, I, I agree with them in principle. Um, I just think that we need to go a bit further and a bit bolder um, because I don't think that realistically people are going to be able to pay off their arrears in, in two years. I think that's a bit of an optimistic perspective on, um, on the way that the economy is going. Um, so what I'd like to see is something that um, I'm sure Wendy will touch on more is um, instead of um, a two year window in which to pay off rent, something like a statutory defense um, of grave hardship. So that if you can prove that you've um, incurred rent arrears uh, due to COVID-19, um, you could have a defense to a rent arrears possession case or even maybe a section 21 um, no fault eviction case that could say I, I shouldn't be evicted because I've occurred these uh, arrears during this period as a result of a pandemic. Um, and I, I echo what Wendy said about really about universal credit and we really need to see a vast increase. I think there's been an increase of £20 a week um, but that's, that's really not sufficient to cover most people's rent. Um, I'll pass on to uh, but I definitely agree with the with the sentiment behind what Labour's policy is. But I I think we should go a bit further. Um, and it is definitely noteworthy that even Joe Biden is saying that we should have um, a, a sort of rent forgiveness period. And I do think that should be on the table going forwards. Hi. Okay. Well, yeah. Very similar thing, Silly. Let's just go through the five points for those who don't know them. 
The first is to extend the temporary ban on evictions for six months, as long as needed. Yeah, we agree to that, but that's toothless. It's meaningless. We have to address the arrears problem. Um, and um, I think we should be really pressing for some sort of similar furlough scheme, which is, you know, it was given to um, employers through, for employment. There's no reason why it couldn't be given for housing. I, we'll never get 100% of the rent for that. I think we should maybe go for 80%. So I would say that. Um, the, there's a, the second proposal is to protect residential tenants from being declared bankrupt by their landlords for non-payment of rent, which um, I think I would agree with. The next one is to get rid of Section 21 altogether, which of course I would also agree with, um, and to get rid of, I mean, I think there needs to be a lot more informed. We need to discuss how we're gonna deal with this arrears problem in more detail. I think the main, my main thrust would be to get the uh, notice period, the temporary ban, and the stay extended till the end of the year so that there can be some meaningful discussion between pressure groups and government because let's face it at the end of the day the Tories have got a very large majority and um, it's going to be hard for us to progress on these things but I really feel that a similar scheme to furlough uh, is possible. Um, then the fourth point is grant renters at least two years to pay back any arrears agree, accrued. Yes, probably we would have to agree to that. But if we had a furlough scheme, those arrears might be much, much lower than they would otherwise be. And to improve um, universal credit and temporary housing. A couple of other things I would like to see, um, which isn't in there, is to get rid of ground aid altogether, which we've already discussed, and abolish the right to buy. That's not in there. And it was in our um, housing manifesto before the 2019 um, eviction. Just to point on costs, I've had in the past well, a lot of clients really who couldn't get legal aid, who uh, filed defences in the county court themselves. Um, quite often there's four statutory grounds, um, for defence grounds for um, Section 21 possession proceedings, which I agree with Dermot, we really should get on the website. Um, but it, usually what happened was if the tenant wasn't represented, the only cost that would be awarded against them was the issue fee of the claim, which was £155, I think, when I was doing it, and possibly a really small fixed fee amount for landlords' costs, particularly if they'd employed lawyers, which they hardly ever did anyway, of about 100 quid. So that's the answer on costs. Yes, unless the defence is frivolous or vexatious, um, I mean, particularly when costs, you know, full costs would be awarded, um, they are liable for costs, but, you know, it's worth taking a punt, particularly depending if you've got thousands and thousands of pounds worth of rent arrears. Okay. So that's me. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I guess I feel like... Um the the liu we're we're ambitious union our our ambition is to like organize the power of london's renters we think that we have to have bold demands to do that so i've already said what our demands are i guess all that there is to say is that we're really disappointed with the with the kind of change of direction in the sense of we feel like um that yeah the kind of headline of like giving renters two years back to pay their debt is just is just all wrong for us um, and it's ultimately still a policy which is about increasing landlordism and moving money from the poorest people to the richest people in society it's not it's not a socially just uh, policy that's it really that's great thanks very much i've got a couple more questions um but before i take them before we move off dermot's point the point was made about what we could be doing in terms of um, helping out with defenses and things um, it's probably a very good idea. It's probably something that we as a subgroup ought to be doing. Um, there is a guide that I've written about Section 21, but it needs to be updated. Um, if anyone would like to see a copy of it, or perhaps more importantly, if anyone would like to help update it, um, then please do send me an email. Um, I've got a question that's been sent in, um, which is uh, something that Claire said about the LIU, um, that the union fights with um, help members to fight with, uh, and win their own housing situation and how does that mesh with the role of lawyers 
And then the second question, I think we've got Sheila with her hand up. Oh, sorry, do you want me to ask it now? Sorry, yes, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm uh, from Labour Housing Group and I would say, first of all, that um, Labour Party policy, as agreed at last year's manifesto, um, a conference, was to not only get rid of Section 21, but also to abolish short-hold tenancies. And to me, this is uh, such a big need and uh, it's been really emphasized over the last dreadful they are and how little understanding there is about what the Tories did to security of tenure in 1988 and uh, if we could only get rid of a short short hold I think we would be in a far better position. Uh, we also agreed to abolish the right to buy. I don't, I don't know that the five point proposal by Thangham um, was the place for that to be said but uh, it, it, it's been agreed over a number of years. Um, we had a, a meeting of the northeast branch of Labour Housing Group at the weekend and the thing we were really agitated about was the lack of information there is for private tenants. So I'm encouraged by what I've heard today but I think what we need is a very very simple guide to um, what, your, what your rights are, where you can get advice and that needs to be so well disseminated um, I, th I think we have a real dearth of information and up to my, my really big question is uh, can somebody write a one page guide to what your rights are and where you can start to get advice and how on earth can we get that disseminated to pretty much every private tenant in the, in the country. Thanks Sheila, perhaps we could have Claire first on the LIU and then if Rosalie and Wendy want to comment on um, how we disseminate legal rights information. Sure. Um, I mean, we, we, we do work with lawyers already. So in the cases where there's kind of illegal evictions, um, we've had help from lawyers. Um, in the cases where there's been harassment, we've had help from lawyers. Um, we do try and have it so that, yeah, as I said, members lead and win their own housing struggles. And I think that's really important. We're not trying to set up, this isn't a service. It's not a client and a, I don't know what the word is. Ah the other thing <laughs> but that's not that's not what we're trying to do and for, and it's interesting hearing you know how do we get people to know their rights or well, a way to know rights is to kind of have to go through that process yourself mm. and have to fight that yourself and then pass on what you learn to your neighbors to your friends etc um but for sure if there's anyone out there who would want to offer the union some pro bono legal help we're, we're always in need of it um and you know often some, sometimes members can only get so far and it, it is necessary at that point that we do have like a legal intervention so you know those things work together can work together very well um i think on this issue of like knowing rights for me there's a really crucial issue of councils here which is that councils have a responsibility to renters and i just don't think they take that at all seriously i was in a call last week with the head of housing in a London borough, who I will not name, who was asking me what I should be doing about renters in their borough, which is which is fine, but it, it points to a complete lack of leadership within councils for taking responsibility for protecting the renters there. This, this, um, this councillor hadn't thought about the fact that lots of renters, when they're issued an eviction notice, don't know that, you know, you can stay until you get a court order and lots of people will, will leave at that point and he hadn't he just hadn't thought about that so i think there's a really crucial role for councils to take in informing renters of their rights and at the moment they don't they don't do that thanks can we have wendy and then rosalie okay um well i think i'd say um, not in any way to detract from the London Renters Union, which I think are brilliant, but I think, you know, having spent many years campaigning on various issues myself, um, it's hard to get collective action with private renters because it's not like, you know, I've done loads of campaigns with tenants on estates about just repair and stuff. There's no cohesive glue to stick them together. So I think, you know, it's brilliant what you're doing, but it's a really difficult task. Um, in terms of disseminating information, I'm more than ha happy to work on something with you, Nick. I can do that now. I've got more time than I had in the past, so 
we can do that. And I'll, sometimes also I do give pro bono advice to the renters union. Um, I think the COVID at the moment, while the crisis is still on, the COVID-19 support groups um, could really, really do with um, a simple sort of guide to um, what very few protections there are for private renters, but also the procedure, because most of them are private renters themselves, from what I can gather from my group and the ones in Hackney. And um, they also refer, well, a lot of people to me. So getting that info out there uh, would be really useful and good. And I think, you know, we've all talked about how this crisis is also an opportunity for progressive steps forward. You know, there's a kind of vacuum in society and um, it feels a bit to me as if the right is getting in there, getting their agenda on the table, getting their privatisation stuff moving in this vacuum and the left really needs to um, step up to the mark, um, is what I think. And then one rather miserable thing that I'd just say to end on, the right to rent was, of course, that case was lost. I think... I think it was in the admin court and the court found that although the right to rent was discriminatory it was lawful <laughs> discrimination which is absolutely horrendous you know and I think also um, I'm not entirely clear Rosalie may be clearer on how the ECHR um, human rights will be binding once we leave Europe um, but I think that is gonna, it's going to be more difficult to rely on the various articles in the ECHR once that happens, even if there is some residual um, ability to do so. So yeah, get the information out there, try and really mobilise a bit around the private rented sector before the shit hits the fan and there's thousands of possession cases. Um, the other thing is, of course, the courts won't be able to cope with it. The courts, courts are not going to be given new resources to deal with all these cases so they're going to be stacked up for years probably you know and who knows how that will fall out that's it thanks rosalie thanks wendy and claire um just to add from what you said i agree with the points that you've you've already mentioned um, I have, I'm not personally involved with LRU, but it really seems like the aim is to have lawyers working collaboratively with, um, as equals with tenants um, and to help on that sort of level, uh, at least that's what I can see at the moment. Um, in terms of the question about Section 21, I think that this, we really, really have a golden opportunity to push this issue now. Um, I mean, the Tories have already said that they want to abolish Section 21, it was in the Queen's speech. And this would be abolishing Section 21 and also uh, Ground 8 would do so much for the private rented sector tenants who right now are in a really perilous position. And it, it would really strengthen, um, strengthen people's rights significantly and would, I think, end the, the fears of a lot of um, evictions that would happen from the 25th of June onwards and into the summer, into the fall, into preceding years. Um, so I think this is something that a lot of people are united on right now and we should really use the opportunity to come together and really push for it as soon as possible. Um, in relation to um, how we could disseminate knowledge about the defences to Section 21 and Grant 8, um, I know there's a lot of really good information out there already. I know I've looked at the LRU website, has a good Q&A section that's really written in plain English for anyone to, to understand what their rights are. And I also would like to point to the work of Shelter has done phenomenal work on explaining the, the defenses and the real intricacies of the law in this area. Uh, I do think there is room to really have a very succinct one, two page paper uh, on really bullet pointing what people could do as soon as they get their notice or as soon as they fall into arrears and then um, what to do if you do end up in court. One idea that I have about ways to disseminate knowledge because the problem with um, the private rented sectors were so disparate we don't know who each other are 
uh, unlike in, you know, in estates, a lot of people know they have one landlord and they can kind of unify um, and, and have demands against that landlord. But one way that we could circumvent um, this problem of being quite disparate is using the, the mutual aid groups that have formed all across the country. If we could put together um, uh, a, a sort of note about people's rights, we might be able to get in touch with different mutual aid groups and say, if you'd like to share this in, in, your, in your groups, then feel free to do so. Because I think a lot of people have come, came together very, very quickly, right after lockdown, even before the lockdown, trying to ensure that people um, could get their food if they were shielding or um, get their prescriptions. Um, I do think that councils, uh, I think it was really apparent uh, at the beginning of the crisis that councils were also like a bit shocked. What do we do? How do we help people? Um, and that's why the mutual aid groups um, got stuck in straight away and the councils kind of came after that. At least that's what I've seen in my own council in Wandsworth. Um, and we do, we should really be demanding better leadership of our councils to protect, um, to protect private sector tenants. And I, I even had difficulty when I was doing research for this talk, trying to find out, well, what, what hardship money is there available for private, private sector tenants? It's very, very difficult to find, if any. Um, and so the real advice is apply for universal credit, um, but not any specific fund that they could apply for if, if they weren't eligible for universal credit, for example, or if they were in that five month, five week waiting list that Wendy, Wendy mentioned. Um, so I think this is a really good good opportunity to to you know use our skills and to and to help as many people as possible, but um, really be shouting about Section Twenty One and and Ground Eight is is I think the main thing that I would um, want to put forward because that will just help so many people straight away. Thanks. We've got time for one more question. Um, I think it's probably more of a political question than a legal question, um, but that's probably fine because we're among comrades. The government's already promised to reform a short trial -short tenant season abolish Section 21 in the Renters Reform Bill, um, and it would be particularly bad if that didn't happen um, until after the current stay um, on evictions passes into law. What do we think of the prospect of the current government passing its Renters Reform Bill um, at a time when it's needed most? Um, and can we take it the same order as the speakers? So Rosalie, Wendy, and then Claire. So it was that the renters reform bill, um, wh what's the prospect of it being passed right after the stay? Because the stay or is- um, Or during the stay, yeah. Before the 25th of June. Um, well, I think it's a quite short time, time frame, but I think what's more likely is that they would extend the stay. Um, that's the just thing to do is extend the stay until you actually have, uh, yeah, exactly as somebody mentioned in the comments, extend the stay until it can be passed. So why should we leave this cliff edge at the 25th of June to, to have this huge amount of people who are also landlords who might be wasting their costs by issuing claims that, um, that they really shouldn't be because it, it's, it's, it's difficult to see how nothing can be done before the 25th of June to help renters because um, we are really coming to a cliff edge and it would be very, very sad to see um, so many people who've been facing economic hardship and will do um, face this cliff edge. So I think we do have a really good opportunity to, um, to push this to the government uh, that this be uh, introduced before um, the stay is lifted. Wendy? Although I agree in principle that um, it would be really great if that could happen, I'm afraid, maybe because I'm older, but I think the chances of it happening before the 25th of June are zero. Um, I think that um, a much better bet would be to try and get the stay and the um, emergency um, provisions, re, uh, non payment, etc., extended till December to give us time to negotiate. If you look at how the government's behaving, they snuck in that reading of the immigration bill yesterday, and that, you know, bill will stop 
uh, many of the um, frontline carers who um, have saved people's lives from new people from getting into the UK and is also very likely to mean that people won't other people won't get their visas renewed so you know unless we can put incredible pressure on the government which I think on this issue is less um, is less likely than pressures around employment um, it won't happen before the 25th of June Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree. I can't see it happening before the 25th of June. I, I think the interesting thing is that the government obviously thought that that was like, you know, this is a populist government. They obviously think there's votes. They think there's votes in renters. And I think that's something that we haven't seen really from previous governments. And I think the fact that they see votes in renters gives me hope that we do have leverage against them. However, we need to get seriously organised before, before that can happen. So, yeah, I, I think um, I would love it if it happened for 25th of June, but I agree. Can't see that happening. Um, yeah. That's great. Thanks. I should just point out we've been talking a bit about universal credit for housing costs. Of course, it's not right that in every local authority area, universal credit is a relevant benefit. And then it's important to check that um, and yeah. it's not true for every type of accommodation either. Um, it only remains for me to thank uh, our three panellists so much and for all the interesting questions that have come in uh, and to say that I look forward to working with our new expanded subgroup um, to do what we can to protect renters in the coming weeks, uh, months and years. Thank you all very much for coming and I hope to see you all soon.